We've called this series Yahweh Remembers because the name Zechariah means the Lord remembers or Yahweh remembers is the very meaning of, of the name. And God has not forgotten Israel. And it's a reminder that even with the writing with the prophecy here of Zechariah, and we mentioned how key this is because Zechariah is quoted 41 times in the New Testament. So as we're going through these chapters, we're seeing, uh, and even tonight, we're going to see various things alluded to in the New Testament. Tonight we're looking at the Lord of all the earth, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. In the first eight verses, we're going to be talking about the eighth vision. The Lord is showing the prophet Zechariah, and tonight it's the vision of the four chariots. We're going to see, first of all, the description of the vision in the first three verses. The Bible says, Now I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming forth from between the two mountains, and the mountains were bronze mountains. Now the reference to bronze mountains in Scripture, usually when bronze is referred to, it's a sign of judgment. For example, the vision of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, what John saw. He saw Jesus that had the feet of bronze. And that was the idea of the judgment. And Jesus, in fact, identified himself in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. As Jesus is writing this letter to the church of Thyatira. In, in Revelation 2.18, the Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze. The Lord is going to speak a message to this church of Thyatira of judgment. And so therefore Jesus alluded to the eyes of flaming fire and the, the feet of burnished bronze, of judgment. And that's what we see in the scriptures. So we see bronze mountains in this description here. Between those two mountains, the mountains were bronze. With the first chariot were red horses. Now Revelation chapter 6, red was associated with war. And then we see with second chariot, black horses. Black was associated with famine in the book of Revelation chapter 6. With the third chariot, white horses. Remember in Revelation chapter 6 that who is riding the white horse in Revelation 6? It's not the Lord Jesus Christ who will ride the white horse in Revelation 19. But there is the rider who has the bow but no arrow to bring false sense of peace. The Antichrist is riding in that uh, the white horse in Revelation 6 with that first seal. It's the deception of conquering, but it was without the arrow. Conquering, not with war. But here we see the white horse meaning victory. And then we see the fourth chariot, strong dappled horses. Now it talks about the two mountains, and these two mountains are most likely Mount Zion. And do you remember the mount where Jesus Christ will come back literally to, and his feet will land upon this mount at the second coming of Jesus Christ? The Mount of Olives. So you have two mountains, Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. Remember when Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives, that the Mount of Olives will split in two. And we're going to see a prophecy even in Zechariah chapter 14 in verse 4. It describes this. This is looking forward to when Jesus Christ will come back literally to this earth. That is the second coming. 
the scripture teaches different from the rapture where Jesus is in the air and the church is caught up to where? To the Lord Jesus, but he's in the air to be snatched up away in the air to be forever with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 describes that glorious event that is called the rapture. But then you have the seven year tribulation period. At the end of that seven years, remember all the armies, the nations that will gather? And in the midst of that, at the battle of Armageddon, that Jesus Christ, Revelation 19, will literally come back as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And he's coming, remember the horse? A white horse, victorious, that he will come, but it says he will step. Now look at this prophecy of Zechariah 14. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. So that's going to happen. That hadn't happened yet, has it, in history? No. But it will when Jesus Christ comes back. So Zechariah has some things that we see fulfilled, and then many of it is future, where it's not yet fulfilled until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The valley between the mountains is called Jehoshaphat, or Jehovah Judges. The day of the Lord is a time of judgment. In the Old Testament, the minor prophets, the prophet Joel proclaims about the day of the Lord. And many with anticipation, however, the day of the Lord is a time of God's judgment upon the earth. You read the book of Revelation from chapter 6 to 19, you see judgment after judgment after judgment being poured out upon the earth. That's a time of judgment. You know, sometimes it's difficult to read because we look at it and there's such devastation that will be poured out upon this earth. Now, I believe with all my heart the church is taken up first. Uh, there's different views. There are those that hold to the mid-tribulation, which would be that the church goes through half of the tribulation and then taken up. There are those, I have had friends that are uh, post-trib, which means they believe the church goes through the whole tribulation and then taken up. But you know, um, uh, I believe a literal reading of Scripture leads to the pre-trib position, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. But it's nothing to break friendship over. <laughs> and so it's nothing to, you know, somebody that differs and, and things like that, that the aspect of, of uh, the end time teaching. So the valley between these mountains is called Jehoshaphat, and I have references for you to look at the, the prophecy by Joel. The four chariots with different colored horses speak of the universality of the divine judgment which will go in all directions throughout the earth. And we're going to see the explanation of the vision. We're going to see more of what the Lord is showing Zechariah. Chapter 12 and verse 4, I'm sorry, Chapter 6 in verse 4. I have my Bible to chapter 12. Chapter 6 in verse 4. Then I spoke and said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these, my Lord? The angel replied to me, These are the four spirits of heaven. Now God has used and will use angels as instruments of judgment. The four spirits of, of heaven... And the Bible says, going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth. The title for the Lord, the Lord of all the earth here, is the title that is focusing on Jesus Christ in his millennial reign. The Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom age. And so that's a title when we think about the Lord ruling over all the earth. And the Bible says, with one of which the black horses are going forth to the north country, 
That's to Babylon. That's to Babylon. Now, where did the Jews come back from that are rebuilding the temple? They've been in Babylonian captivity. You know what? You see Babylon again, don't you? In the book of Revelation, you have religious Babylon, and then you have commercial Babylon. Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18, that they're going to be destroyed. Re uh, Babylon's going to be rebuilt. And, and you have this, and then the destruction. So we think about Babylon, and, and the Bible says that is to the north. And the Bible says, the white ones go forth after them. That is the black horses, probably famine, the white ones, victory, go forth after them while the dappled ones go forth to the south country. South country of Jerusalem here is talking about Egypt. It's Egypt. When the strong ones went out, they were eager to go to patrol the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried out to me and spoke to me saying, see, those who are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. That his wrath would be satisfied. The righteous wrath of the Lord. The explanation of the vision. So we see the black and the white horses go to the north country. This is Babylon. The white horses, symbolizing victory, go after the black ones. And the dappled ones are going to the south country, Egypt. Dr. Fink at Liberty uh, University in the Liberty Bible Commentary talks about these eight night visions are complementary to Daniel's vision. For both of them deal with the times of the Gentiles. Daniel's vision from the Gentile point of view, Zechariah's from Israel's point of view. The eight night visions then take us prophetically from the Babylonian captivity to the millennial kingdom, looking at that period of time from Israel's perspective. From Israel's perspective. So Zechariah, because its focus is on Israel, where Daniel's focus was on the Gentile nations. So you have a complementary here of what's going on in these visions and what's going to lead to the end. I want you to go to point two. God crowns his king priest. Verses 9 through 15. There's going to be three main C's in this part of the outline. The first one is the word confrontation. Confrontation. In verses 9 through 11, we see this introduced again in verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, but this isn't a night vision. The night vision was the, the first... Uh, I was, I'm looking at the wrong reference again. I apologize. Now here we see in verse 9, the word of the Lord also came to me saying, take an offering from the exiles from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, and you go to the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they have arrived from Babylon. Take silver and gold so there are Jews coming from Babylon and they've had an offering of silver and gold and they bring that to Zechariah. Now why are they, there, there's two main problems that are going on here. The visitors are facing two problems. What's this money been collected for? The restoration of rebuilt, finished rebuilding the temple. To help finish the temple that's being rebuilt. So, when I say, uh, Wearsby makes the point in, in his book, Be Heroic, the commentary on this, that what happens, he called it confrontation for this reason. Those coming back with the silver and gold are saying, no, this is being used for the rebuilding of the temple. But the Lord's going to instruct Zechariah and say, no, you're going to make a crown out of this silver and gold. So, we see that in verse 11. The Lord commands... Zechariah, take silver and gold, 
make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, in it, who, who usually wears the crown? The king. Remember who's the governor? Who's in charge of the rebuilding of the temple is Zerubbabel. But he didn't say, go and take and make this crown and put it on the head of Zerubbabel. No, he says, take it and put it on the head of Joshua, the high priest. That's very important. This is a type of Christ here. Joshua is an Old Testament picture of Jesus. And it's interesting because you know what the name Joshua means? The Lord saves. Joshua and the New Testament name, the Greek name as we know where we get Jesus, the Lord shall save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ. So you have the correlation here. And so the second issue is there was no precedent in Scripture for a priest to be crowned king. Now we read in the book of Genesis, there was a man who was both king and priest. And Jesus is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You find him in Genesis. When Abraham had come back from the battles against the kings and, and uh, you know, rescued Lot and his family in these battles. And so what happened is the king of Mel or Melchizedek was the king of Salem, the king of peace, and he was a priest in the Old Testament. But under the Levitical order, when I'm talking about the, the establishment of the law with the priest, there never was one who was a priest that was count, you know, would be cre uh, uh, crowned as king serving as priest. So this is something totally new along the Jewish line. It's, 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 never, it's something totally new here. So let's look at point B, the coronation. The instruction that Zechariah receives. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold a man whose name is Branch. Now who's that a title for? Jesus. That title is found in Jeremiah. The Branch. It's cap in your Bibles it should be capitalized. It's a capital B because that's a title for Jesus. The Branch for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Now, we have to remember, there are four temples that have a place in Israel's history. The first temple we know, remember David's desire to build a house for the Lord? He says, here we are in our... Uh, in our homes, and there's the, the ark and the tent. And so he has the desire and says, I want to build a house for the ark of the covenant, the ark of the Lord. And the Lord, you know, Nathan at that time, the prophet says, yeah, go ahead. Sounds good. But that night, the Lord appeared to Nathan and said, tell David, he's not to be the one who is going to build the temple. Why? The Bible says he was a man of war because he had shed much blood. So his son, and out of that, become very familiar with 2 Samuel 7. It's so important because in that chapter, you have the Davidic covenant. You have God making a covenant with David. And he says, you know what, David? Thank you. I appreciate the, your desire to, to build a temple. But no, you're not going to do it. Your son will. And, and as Bruce was talking about in Sunday school this morning, he was referencing this, that, that the idea was there was uh, David helped to get things ready for his son to build the temple. So it was known as Solomon's temple. 
the first, wasn't it? Remember what was glorious? Just as the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle when Moses did exactly as God gave in the pattern, guess what? When the temple is finished, done exactly as God said, they have finished the temple. The Bible says the priest could not continue to minister. Why? Because the glory of the Lord filled the temple. You know what? The Lord said, I'm in your midst. I'm in your midst. In the Old Testament, where was the meeting place with God? Solomon's temple. On one time a year, the high priest would go into the holiest of holies. Give a, bring a sacrifice for his sins and his family's sins before he brought the, the sacrifice for the sins of the nation. To sacrifice there into the holiest of holies. So you have Solomon's temple. Oh, but that's destroyed, isn't it? 586 B.C., as the Babylonian captivity, full, uh, there were Jews that were beginning to be carried away in 605 B.C. to Babylon. 586 B.C., you have Jerusalem destroyed. You have the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. So it's now is when Cyrus had, uh, Cyrus had given the order to rebuild the temple. And so there were 50,000 Jews come from Babylon back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. This is the second temple. It's called Zerubbabel's temple. That's the temple we're talking about when we studied Haggai and also here in Zechariah. They were prophesying at this time. They were contemporaries. And so Zerubbabel's temple is the second temple. But guess what? That temple is going to be renovated by Herod. So the temple then that is there at the time of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would be known as Herod's temple. Remember the beauty? The disciples said, look at how the, the buildings and the, look at all the, the glorious building it is. And the Lord said, those stones will not be upon each other, but utter destruction. Remember who's going to destroy it? Romans. Remember AD 70. It's going to be destroyed. So that's the third temple. But you know what? The Bible says there's going to be a fourth temple. Ezekiel chapters 40 and 48 will describe what is known as the millennial temple. The millennial temple that will be used during the millennial kingdom. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And you know who the, the scriptures say who's going to build it? The Lord. The Lord will build that temple. That's the prophecy. It says, yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne and the council of peace will be between the two offices. What offices is what is uh, what is the Lord telling here, Zechariah, what two offices the Lord will have? Well, he actually has the threefold office. He's the anointed prophet, priest, and king. But priest and king are the emphasis here in Zechariah. The two offices that will be in the one man, Jesus Christ, is priest and king in the book of Zechariah. Priest and king. We might look at this and say, is this really important? Yes. You know who it's really important to also? Israel. Israel. I think the book of Zechariah is a great proof that God's not done with Israel. I think it's a great proof against the teaching of replacement theology. Replacement theology, I'll give you a quick definition. Replacement theology is the idea that the church replaces Israel. But the Bible, even the New Testament, Romans chapters 9 through 11, keep the church and Israel separate. 
church and Israel are kept separate. Now that doesn't mean that the church has no, you know, there are believing Jews in the church. In fact, the early church were all Jews that had come to know the Lord. But I'm talking about that there is still going to be a focus in which there will be a third, a remnant of the Jews will be preserved during the tribulation period by Almighty God. They will be protected as they go through the tribulation. And we're going to see this as we study the book of Zechariah. What will they do when they see Jesus Christ literally coming back? They will look upon Him whom they pierced and believe. Now we are recipients of the precious blessings of the new covenant, aren't we? When Jesus Christ instituted the new covenant, how? With His own blood. We are recipients, but you know who the new covenant was made with? Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, found in Hebrews 8, recorded, the new covenant was made with Israel. Because you know what? For Israel, it's yet future, because as a whole right now, is Israel in belief or unbelief? As a whole, they're in unbelief right now. Until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, the Bible says there's a partial hardening in, in the book of Romans. But guess what? They will look upon him whom they pierced and believe. And guess what? Their sins will be washed away. The precious truth of the new covenant will be experienced by Israel when they believe. It's going to be the remnant. It'll be the third that will be preserved during that tribulation period. And so Zechariah, this is all prophecy. So the coronation, the Lord of hosts told Zechariah to convey to Joshua that he would typify the branch who will rebuild the millennial temple. Point two, Wiersbe makes here, no priest in Jewish history ever served as king and the one king, Uzziah, who tried to become a priest, was severely judged by the Lord. Remember, he goes in and tries to offer the sacrifices to the Lord. This will be a fulfillment of God's promise to David that he would always have an heir seated on his throne. He will always have an heir seated on his throne. Zerubbabel was a governor, but he wasn't a king. He's come back and leading the rebuilding of the temple. Go, we're familiar with the announcement of the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ to Mary in Luke chapter 1. But I want you to see in verses 32 and 33... What is said about Jesus? Luke 1, 32 and 33. So Zechariah is prophesying about Jesus sitting on the throne of his father David as king and priest. But the Bible says here in Luke 1, 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. This is fulfilling that covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel 7. He's always going to have an heir on that throne, and that is the ultimate fulfillment is Jesus Christ. Because if you... See, and, and when Matthew starts out, it says, Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The focus on Jesus as the king of the Jews. In verse 32, he's the son of the most high. He will all, he'll give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. There's some today that want to ignore the idea of Jesus and his kingdom. We pray in that model prayer, Jesus taught, 
The disciples understood this because they knew of the Old Testament teaching. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. There's coming a kingdom. There's coming a time where Jesus Christ will sit on David's throne and he will reign forever and ever. And keep saying ever. <laughs> he will reign. That's what the scripture teaches. This will be a fulfillment. Oh, the glorious news. In the kingdom there will be perfect peace and justice because all civil and religious authority will be harmonized in one person. Who's it harmonized in? Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The final C I want you to see is commemoration. In Zechariah chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, it's interesting what Zechariah is going to say to do with this crown. Joshua has been placed upon him, but it doesn't stay on Joshua. It doesn't stay on his head. The Bible says in verses 14 and 15, now the crown will become a reminder Oh, guess where it's going to be? And put in the temple of the Lord. To Helam, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. That's the name for Josiah there, the son of Zephaniah. Those who are far off, the Gentiles, that title is meant for the Gentiles. Those who are far off will come and build the temple of the Lord. The prophecy in Isaiah 60 says that the Gentiles will help the Jews. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and it will take place if you completely obey the Lord your God. What has God always called for his people to do? Listen and obey him. But how did they do in the Old Testament? Not too well. Not too well. I just want to read this last paragraph. Dr. Fink in the commentary wrote, Messiah the branch will demand absolute obedience. Israel missed the point of the memorial crown and did not recognize the universal ministry and mission of their Messiah. The certainty of Israel's future in the Messianic kingdom is not impaired by Israel's failure. For God's future program depends upon God himself. That's so important. God's program depends on God himself. He has the timeline. <laughs> He knows when the, the agenda is. And here's the reality. You know, there was some thinking years ago that we could speed up the time of Christ. No, we can't. Those times are set by Almighty God. He's not going to come any quicker. It's not left up to us. <laughs> Sometimes, there's even some of the old hymns, or some of the, the old thought, especially those that were post-millennialists that thought we could usher in and you know, the, that you had the kingdom first and then Christ coming at the end of the kingdom. But after world wars, guess what? That teaching didn't stay very popular because nobody thinks that things are getting better. Anybody here tonight think things are getting better in our world? No, I, I have news for you. It's bad and it's going to get worse. How do I know that? Because what Paul wrote Timothy and what Peter wrote and talks about the latter days. And, and you know what? We read that and we can see that sense. So we're not going to speed up the time of the Lord coming. It's, it's not based on Paul. He has the time. Uh, he has it all under control. It's depending upon him himself. However, Israel's enjoyment of blessing and benefit does depend upon their obedience. Hence the prophet concludes, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. The Israel of Zechariah's day and our day has failed. 
But the Israel of the future will obey completely and will experience national regeneration and all of the blessings Messiah will bring. We have to be careful today. There are popular teachers that teach that Jews don't have to come to know Jesus to be saved. Nowhere is that taught in the Word of God. Nobody gets to heaven outside of believing on the Lord. It's salvation by grace through faith alone. There are some that, that teach that the Jews, God's people, and since they're God's people, and say, oh, they're just, they're going to be in the kingdom. You know, there's, it's like what we talked about this morning with the thinking of the Pharisees. But no. The Bible says they have to believe. Who's going to be saved? Those that come through the tribulation. When they look upon Jesus, whom they pierce, they're going to mourn, they're going to grieve. But they're going to believe. And they're going to be washed. Their sins will be washed. They will be regenerated. And that is the scriptural truth. Nobody gets to heaven outside of by faith in the Lord, by trusting in Him. And so today Jews need to come to know Jesus. And thankfully there, there's a remnant in the church. There's a remnant of Jews being saved today. There are. I had a professor at Tyndale Seminary. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, he wrote a book called Israelology, the, the, the Missing Link to Systematic Theology. It's about a 1,500-page book. And you know what? He's a Jewish, he's a Messianic Jew, he's a Jewish believer that has a burden to see his family come to know Jesus. There's Jews for Jesus. There's ministries. The Southern Baptists have, a, I, I've talked to a missions director in Israel that lives near Jerusalem. And he works alongside other ministries. And there's missionaries, there's those that are, and he's told me before, he says, I'm seeing, he said, they're more open to the gospel than they've ever been. I'm sitting rejoicing. There's people being saved. They're having youth camps, sports camps near Jerusalem. He said their favorite sport is soccer. And they're playing soccer and they're sharing the gospel with young, young Jewish people, young, young Jews. And then sharing Jesus Christ with them. There are people coming to know the Lord. So there is that remnant. But as a whole, the Bible says they're in unbelief right now. But they will believe. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father. The title, the Lord of all the earth, that you are sovereign. We're fascinated in Zechariah, all the prophecies. And how prevalent this is in showing us even in the kingdom. And how this will be fulfilled as we read in the book of Revelation. But it's a reminder too that you're not done with Israel. Oh, Lord, we do rejoice in the Jews that are coming to know you. But we also know that there will be Jews that will be saved when they look upon you, when you come back. And it says they will be saved. Sins washed away. Thank you, Lord, for the glorious truth. Thank you, Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. And Lord, as we look to this, there's so many things we covered tonight, but Lord, I pray that you just press it upon our hearts. How precious your word is. And as we study this, that our eyes are open to the wondrous truth. So many of these things are prophecies of things yet to come. And as we continue through, that you would just be lifted up. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.